Uh, welcome back, everyone. I, I assume that uh, you enjoyed a short break. Uh, as mentioned by Tariq, I am Dr. Jun Lee, Chief of Financial Sector for ADB. Uh, we like to have an open discussion with a focus on drivers of financial inclusion, particularly fintech and innovative financial solutions. Uh, CARIC member representatives will share their insights on the topic. We have with us Mr. Koba Gavinataz. Mr. Koba uh, Gavinataz has held positions of Deputy State Minister and Deputy Finance Minister of the Georgia before becoming Governor of the National Bank of Georgia. From Azerbaijan, we have Mr. Uh, the Rashad uh, uh, Urchop, uh, Executive Director of Central Bank, who has over who has over two decades of experience with the Central Bank. And with us as well is Ms. Uh, Yuan Liu, Vice President, Visitor Currency Institute and People's Bank of China. Uh, Ms. Liu joined Payment and Settlement Department of the PBC since 2011 after several years of experience as an auditor in the K uh, KPMG Beijing and joined Visitor Currency Institute of the PBOC this month. And uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Bob uh, Chakraborty, the Chief Economist Ripple and Bob has been the CEO of the Chakra Advisors and Chief Econ. Now, allow me to begin to moderate the session and let me kindly remind you about a golden principle. This golden principle is about five minutes speaking time and for everybody. And I believe everybody wants to keep the golden principle like gold. And allow me to remind you when you spend more than five minutes, as a reminder, and then let me step in to remind. And so please forgive me when I step in. And let's go to the first question. Uh, first question is, what are the innovative solutions to promote financial inclusion? What have been the challenges? For example, regulatory constraints, lack of IT infrastructure, lack of policy coordination, and et cetera, and responses. And distinguished speaker, speaker from Georgia, Mr. Koba Gavinatas, uh, uh, and Governor of the National Bank of Georgia, you have five minutes to discuss. Please go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for invitation. And I also set up the timer to make sure that uh, I do my intervention for five minutes. We definitely think that innovations um, uh, and the development of financial technologies have an important role in financial inclusion. We have a financial and supervision technology department through which we focus on innovative financial products, services, and business models. And um, we, with this, we aim to create the fintech ecosystem in Georgia. So we think that the uh, tools to help innovation development in financial, financial sectors that by itself increase um, financial inclusion, inclusion are innovative, innovation office, open banking, regula regulation laboratory, digital banking license. And let me briefly talk about those. Um, uh, so taking into account complexity of the regulatory flame, framework, um, we set up the innovation office to assist stakeholders in navigation. And I mean, this is sort of the communication platform that aims to help innovative ideas turn into marketable and legally acceptable business models. And we receive a lot of requests uh, to work on some models. And uh, I think it is very, very uh, promising um, uh, tool that we have. Um, and one obstacle to the development of innovative services is improper regulation, or sometimes an absence of regulations at all. So this can be addressed with the regulation uh, laboratory, and which aims at creating a safe and fair regulatory environment, environment in Georgia. And it allows regulated entities to test the new ideas and make skates uh, to adapt regulation to evolving market needs. We have very well-developed banking system, but in order to test this kind of products, I think that, I mean, this laboratory is really important for us. Uh, in the medium term, we see the need to increase digital financial services. To encourage this process, we introduced a digital banking framework and uh, that has relatively easier entry requirements compared to traditional, uh, traditional banking. Uh, for example, lower capital requirements at the initial point. And with digital banking a license, we expect to develop fintech friendly business models such as branchless banking, banking as a service, wholesale banking, white label services. 
Um, and uh, one of the major tools in promoting the development of fintech companies and financial inclusion um, is the development of open banking framework, and uh, which we think could be a game changer, um, uh, not only Georgia, all over the world as well. And information that the bank has about the consumer um, is a property of the bank, and open banking makes it possible uh, for consumer to share the information with third-party providers through digital channels, which means that there is more opportunities for consumers, and then and, and uh, um, uh, users of the uh, system have more incentives to look at opportunities and uh, to be more active on this. And uh, um, uh, two more things I want to highlight at the end of the uh, my, my my five minutes intervention is that uh, while uh, we think that these technologies are very important, they are not the only ones. And we think that financial education uh, and consumer protections is very important. So this might be sort of the uh, like old fashioned values, but uh, I don't think so. And let me give you a very short example. For example, in Georgia, financial inclusion, if you measure it by the number of accounts, financial transactions is very high, very high. But what we have observed is that people who have been defaulting on their loans, consumer loans main, mainly, and who have been uh, entered as sort of black entries in the credit bureau have increased. So we noticed that it was really necessary to do something about it because these people were lost from financial sector. Once they would get the status of blacklisted, they were not able to participate in it. So this was bad for them because they had to go to informal sector, and at the same time, um, they have been lost as uh, uh, as a clients for financial sector. So uh, we uh, introduced uh, responsible uh, lending principles, uh, which asks financial institutions to check credit worthiness of the clients. And what we observed very quickly is that it definitely worked, and we saw more. Uh, participation of households um, and even companies, small companies in the financial sector. Um, so if I had time, I would spoke defi speak defi definitely much more about it. But I think that these are the directions we are looking at. So definitely innovation, technology, we are supporting it as much as possible, creating ecosystem. But let's also not forget about the old and gold values like uh, financial education, uh, like consumer protection, because this is very, very important for financial inclusion uh, in the country. And one more sector section which I would talk about, but not now, would be payment systems, and we are also very active on this, and this would be very important down the road for financial inclusion. Thank you. I guess I made my promise, so it's five minutes. Thank you so very much. Uh, you know, we learned a lot and about those uh, financial education and also the consumer protection and others, and thanks a lot. The second question is, what could be the roles of regional cooperation platforms, such as CARIB, to effectively support member countries to promote financial inclusion through innovation? And let me introduce our distinguished speaker from Georgia, Azerbaijan. Uh, Mr. Rashad and uh, Oljov, an executive director, Central Bank of Republic of uh, Azerbaijan. And you have five minutes to discuss. Please go ahead. Jinku, I think Mr. Rashad is uh, temporarily stepped out of the meeting, so we can call the next speaker. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me ask uh, Ripple and Visa to share their insights and on their innovative approaches for financial inclusion across the world and lessons learned and policy recommendations for Carrick region. And uh, let me ask Dr. Bob and Chakra, uh, Chakra, Chakra Borti, the chief economist, Ripple to share your insight. You have five minutes to uh, share your insights. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Lee. It's uh, certainly an honor and pleasure to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be. I am Bob Chakra Borti, the chief economist at Ripple. Uh, let me thank uh, Carrick and the Astana International Financial, uh, Finance Center for the opportunity to participate on this uh, very important, timely, and engaging panel. It is certainly an honor and privilege. Uh, it is a pleasure to be among central bankers and other public authorities. After spending many years as a central bank economist, it's certainly good to be uh, back in this crowd. Uh, in addition, I'd also like to point out that my first assignment coming out of graduate school was in Central Asia, 
uh, to advise uh, countries there as they, as they became independent republics in the, in the mid-90s. When I advised uh, newly formed governments on building financial systems, so it's great to see uh, various advancements that have taken place today. Although we are virtual today, it is certainly exciting to discuss issues uh, uh, pressing in the region. Let me first by give you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I joined Ripple about two months ago, but I want to stress that I'm, uh, although I'm new in the role, I'm not new to fintech, uh, cryptocurrency, or financial services more broadly. Uh, fintech firms challenge how incumbents provide financial services by addressing various pain points, such as cost, access, convenience, transparency, and speed. And it's great to see that many of the speakers have pointed out the important role that fintech can play. Increasingly, these services are using mobile platforms to bring people into the financial system, as mentioned before. Uh, according to the 2017 Global Findex report, 1.7 billion adults remain unbanked, but two-thirds of them own a mobile phone. So this is certainly a place where we can uh, expand. The delivery of digital financial services on mobile platforms is critical to increase financial inclusion. Let me talk a little bit about Ripple now. What we're trying to do is we're trying to democratize financial systems like the internet democratized information. We can bring billions of people into the global financial system. Ripple leverages blockchain and cryptocurrency to provide global payment services and there are increasing use cases beyond payments. Today, we'll, we'll talk about uh, remittances uh, specifically. But before we get there, blockchain technology allows for the integration of separate networks across countries with their own standards and systems. For example, the internet is one system globally. You can uh, go to any site. However, with financial transactions, there are certain specific, specific requirements within each country. And as the last speaker talked about, standardization is very important. From the earliest days, Ripple has been partnering with banks, payment system service providers, and other financial institutions to expand and improve offering, offerings within the system. We believe that change can come from within the financial system. More recently, we've been working with payment service providers. Let me give you a couple of examples. We've worked with Bcash, it's one of our customers, which is the largest mobile wallet provider in Bangladesh, and help them with remittances, specifically with the channel um, that they have. They have 36 million consumers using their app. 90% were newly banked, which is quite impressive. We've also been working with Flutterwave, which is based in Nigeria, a provider of B2B payment services for 60,000 plus businesses, many of them SMEs, which is another Ripple partner. Again, uh, giving access to RippleNet, our network globally. Let me now turn to the example of remittances. One challenging area is remittance payments, which account for significant payment inflows in many developing countries. Remittances are critical for economic growth, as cited by several speakers before. For example, remittances in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are equal or greater to, each, uh, to a third of each country's GDP. Traditionally, these payments have been slow, expensive, and had high fees, and timing uh, has not been transparent to uh, end users. Let me give you an example back from the 1990s during my time at the Dallas Fed, where I used to study Mexican payment systems since we had some role uh, over Mexican banks and U.S. banks operating in Mexico. At the time, one of the large Mexican banks was charging 10% to cash a U.S. dollar check and putting six-week hold periods on it. When I asked why the bank was doing that, the answer was, well, because we could. And so there was opportunities, there was a lack of competition, and technology quite wasn't there. Things have certainly improved. The COVID-19 pandemic has further uh, uh, taught us about the lack of effective payments infrastructure, especially the importance of an end-to-end -end digital one. Although digital solutions are gaining traction, cash is still popular. 60% of remittances today are not sent digitally. Our, our most active region for Ripple is Asia. Asian countries have historically been underserved by correspondent banking and have limited reach and expensive liquidity solutions. One important issue that comes up when you talk about fintech, financial systems, banking in general, is the issue of regulation and safety. 
As with most financial innovations, there are risks that need to be managed along with compliance with various laws and regulations such as anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing rules. Ripple encourages a continuous and engaging dialogue between private sector and public authorities. And we do this uh, daily across the world. In addition, greater education and awareness of the benefits of financial innovations are also needed. This is a very important area uh, that CARIC should, should look into for multiple reasons, such as the lack of financial services from a US-based company's OFAC pro, uh, prohibitions, the lack of digital infrastructure resulting in high reliance on cash for financial transactions. Also, a lack of reliable service providers may, may result in higher prices. We look forward to engaging with you about how to increase financial inclusion in your region in a safe and efficient manner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bob uh, Chakraborty. Uh, I, it is really good uh, to share, listen from you about your sharing of your innovations in payment services and remittances. And let me invite Mr. Salvador Perez Galindo, uh, Vice President, CMEA Government Engagement of the Visa Corporation. And uh, Mr. Salvador, and you have the podium right now. Please go ahead. Thank you, Professor. And thank you again to Karek for the invitation. It's a pleasure joining you from Dubai. I am responsible for a government relations public policy for a big macro region that is uh, handled from Dubai that uh, encompasses close to 90 countries ranging from Russia to South Africa, Morocco to Pakistan. So in my intervention, I would like to share a few thoughts about how we see the fintech space, some of the opportunities and some of the challenges that we see uh, as, as a private sector player and uh, as a leading uh, payment system operator in the world where we are important to keep in mind that we are no longer plastic and, and payment cards. There's still the image of uh, a traditional form factor, which is what we call uh, a payment card. In reality, we prefer to talk about payment credentials. So the value that we bring for fintechs uh, all over the world, but in, in, in Central Asia in particular, is the possibility to, to connect with a bigger network and provide payment credentials that can be used in any device, whether it's a card, uh, a mobile device, a phone, or a, for e-commerce, it doesn't matter. What matters is the the payment account, the transaction account that, that we provide. Let me just perspective about the importance of fintech. In 2020, according to KPMG, we saw more than $1 billion, sorry, $100 billion in deals all over the world. What we saw in our region in 2020 was also a significant growth but it's still very minor in comparison with big regions like North America, Asia Pacific. Probably less than 3%, we saw uh, around 200 FinTech deals. Still a very impressive growth, but the opportunity is enormous. And we hope that we can provide an opportunity to continue developing the ecosystem. Uh, what we are doing is basically very simple. We are providing an opportunity for FinTechs to connect with incumbent players. It's very important to maintain the principle of collaboration, competition. It's not a serious sum game. The more success that we have in terms of bringing new players, bringing new solutions, and collaborating with incumbent players, the more impactful uh, contribution that we will have to uh, FinTech development. We had uh, an important challenge recently, a FinTech challenge, and I have the pleasure to, to share, and, and particularly since the Georgia governor is here, that we had a Georgian fintech winning the contest that has been granted a PSP license by the National Bank of Georgia. And we hope that that solution will be able to uh, expand to Central Asia. Uh, Payset has already plans to go to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan. So it's precisely this type of solutions that we believe are very important to really take full potential of fintech. I am keeping track of my time, so I'm gonna be talking faster to be able to uh, address all the key issues. We work with fintechs, not only as ecosystem development, but also 
granting direct licensing to our system. And that's something that we're already doing in Central Asia, entities like D-Line in Kazakhstan, Humans in Uzbekistan, and Alif Bank in Tajikistan, which has become now uh, uh, the first uh, innovative digital bank, or one of the first digital banks in the region. So this is part of uh, what we're doing. In terms of the opportunities, we see many opportunities, but particularly important to address small and medium-sized business initiatives with Econ. The previous panel emphasized the importance of ensuring we have those solutions in markets. And that's our commitment. We expect to be able to onboard at least 5 million SMBs within the next few years. We're doing this in close association with these fintechs. The challenges, five key challenges. We need to fix telecom connectivity. Unfortunately, the very basic foundation is not there. Secondly, regulatory fragmentation. We still don't see convergence of regulations. It would be great. I was making the reference about the PSP uh, we are working with in Georgia, that we have some type of licensing portability so that we can really scale and expand the fintech deployments that we are doing in the region. Convergence in terms of licensing requirements, convergence in terms of EKYC, digital onboarding is very important. And I hope that with CARIT, we can work on those very specific issues. Without scalable and interoperable solutions, we won't be able to have successful fintech impact. And the last and uh, nevertheless very important aspect is to converge with international standards on data security and interoperability. The payments industry has that. That's part of our promise. And that's what we're building for the fintech space in Central Asia. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Perez Galindo. Uh, thank you for sharing your uh, fintech spaces of opportunities and challenges, including telecom connectivity, regulation conversion, such as EKYC. I want to say thank everybody and for very great, valuable inputs. And let me also greatly appreciate all distinguished speakers to make the session remain on the planned timeline. And you kept the golden rule as gold. And thank you very much. And right now, uh, now we move on to the open discussion. Uh, where anyone may want to comment, raise, uh, okay, wait, let me see. All right, okay, yeah. And uh, let me, you know, uh, anyone uh, may want to comment and raise new issues or share new perspective on the pandemic and financial stability. Let me open the session to the floor for any comment or question. Thank you. I see there is a comment from Tajikistan distinguished speaker, Mr. Uh, Miha Yot and Yoku Joda, uh, Deputy Chairman, National Bank of Tajikistan. Uh, please forgive my pronunciation if my pronunciation is not correct. Uh, uh, Deputy Chairman, National Bank of Tajikistan, you have uh, the minutes to uh, uh, share your comments. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much, distinguished colleagues. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for this meeting. Uh, during such a hard uh, socio-economic period for all the countries uh, during the COVID, I will try to follow the golden rule and uh, walk in five minutes. At the moment, uh, we are implementing the whole scale uh, and important uh, measures to ensure economic stability in the country, satisfying the urgent needs to finance the payment balance and uh, uh, maintaining the uh, relevant uh, costs for uh, healthcare and education. The growth rates of Tajikistan as of 2020 have slowed down and there was only 4.5%, which is 3% less, lower compared to 2019. At the same time, due to the normalized situation with pandemic uh, and uh, high economic activity, the growth rate of GDP for the five years of 2021 was 8.6% uh, was caused by the growth of industry, agriculture, construction, and retail. The inflation level for five months of 2021 is 2.2%. 2 
4.4%, which is one point less compared to the similar period of the last year. And is caused by the growth of prices for food and uh, uh, non-food products. And the annual inflation is 8.4%, which is 1.6% lower uh, compared to last year. Facing the issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we took a number of measures to support the financial markets of the country and approved the action plan to prevent possible impact of pandemia on the national economy, banking sector, and insurance sector. To promote sustainability of banking system, the government of Tajikistan to support the uh, borrowers who face uh, temporary financial burden, uh, hardships caused by pandemic. We are asking the financial institutions to reconsider the uh, borrowing or lending conditions. Therefore, now banks are now restructuring more than 49,000 uh, services, totaling two and a half billion of. Uh, some, and we also introduced a moratorium for penalties on uh, individuals and companies uh, with hardships. And to serve the economy, the refinancing rate was reduced twice in May and in August 2020 by 200 basic points, and it's set up now at 10.75%. At the same time, the provision of reserves uh, uh, until the 31st of December 2020 was reduced from 3 to 1 percent in the national currency and from 9 to 5 percent in the foreign currency. I should also note that in early 2021, uh, due to the improvement of the economic situation to uh, preserve the liquidity of banking institutions such as the Fiction Levant or National Bank, took the decision to reconsider the standard for the uh, mandatory provisions for financial reserves uh, of the banking sector. And in the first quarter of 2021, uh, it uh, reached, uh, it was brought to the level of 2012 to prevent additional costs and to support financial status of the banking sector. Credit is exempt from payment of the charges for the use of the payment system. To implement all the above measures, uh, this facilitated the stability of the financial and banking system, and as a result, the key indicators of sustainable financial sustainability, such as the level of uh, uh, margin of the capital and the liquidity level remains at sufficient level. Therefore, the entire banking system compared to the previous period turns out to be more sustainable and able to uh, combat the challenges. Uh, the growth rate of Tajikistan, uh, to a great extent, uh, as we all know, depends on the uh, uh, rates of growth of uh, global economy and the growth of partners. And uh, in some cases, uh, the government of Tajikistan is uh, prepared to continue applying the measures to support the economy and social sectors of the country. And to conclude, I would like to thank you again for the organizing this meeting, and I wish you good health and uh, be safe and sound. Thank you very much. You remain on the right time. Very, very appreciate and very insightful comments. We learned a lot from you. And may I now call on Mr. Azor and to give a short summary and close the meeting. Mr. Azor, are you there? Yes. Okay, please come in. You have five minutes to close. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank everyone uh, uh, for taking the time today uh, and to join this important event. I would like to express my gratitude to um, the moder moderators and the panelists who shared uh, with us their valuable insight and experience. Uh, today we had a, a very rich discussion on an important topic in the first panel. Country representatives uh, shared with us uh, the importance of financial inclusions, uh, also the priorities, and then how they uh, dealt with uh, uh, this issue during the COVID-19 uh, a crisis, as well as also the challenges that they have faced uh, uh, during the crisis related to financial inclusion. Of course, those challenges are not unique for CARIC members. However, the relative uh, weak starting point in many uh, of the Caucasus and Central Asian countries and some of the setbacks, like, for example, uh, the share of informal economy constitute a risk. And therefore, it's important uh, to uh, strengthen 
uh, the work on financial inclusion in order to give an additional dimension to the recovery. And therefore, against the backdrop of the various views that were uh, presented, uh, a holistic approach is uh, recommended in order to promote financial inclusion. This could be done on three pronged approach. One is macroeconomic and financial stability in order to lay very solid ground uh, for uh, both uh, financial institutions as well as also private sector to uh, benefit from uh, um, uh, potential opportunities and avoid crowding out. Second is the institutional dimension, strengthening institutions, uh, providing credible and clear policy frameworks are very important. And three, operational dimensions, uh, namely improving business environment, improving the quality of infrastructure, and strengthening in it. Um, um, the, also, during the session, we saw the uh, partnership role that IFIs can help. Uh, and various speakers uh, reiterated uh, the level of support that their institution could provide, be it in terms of analytical work, technical assistance, or finance, financing facilities, as well as also in the context of country-specific programs. Second session was also very interesting because it provided the, the dual approach from authorities as well as also representative of the private sector. Uh, we saw uh, a very engaged discussion around innovation and how innovation in financial technologies can help, but also uh, we saw that a certain number of constraints are still there, arising from issues related to deficit in infrastructure regulatory framework, coordination issue that could complicate the, uh, the process, as well as also the interaction between private and public sector. This is being said. Clearly, uh, financial innovations are here to stay. And what this crisis showed us, that there will be acceleration of those trends. And therefore, it's very important to embrace those changes, adapt uh, uh, their use, and uh, uh, provide for um, both uh, uh, SMEs, um, individuals, as well as also, uh, as we saw uh, with the example of remittances, uh, the capital flow to be boosted by uh, the use of technology while also having the right super supervision and regulatory framework. Um, thank you very much. I'm sure that this issue uh, and this topic will remain with us. And this is an important dimension going forward in terms of accelerating the recovery. Once again, thank you very much and uh, great pleasure. Uh, doctor, again, um, the floor is yours. Safta, maybe this is the time we close. Yes, please go ahead and just we can close now. Uh, if there is no further uh, discussion, and I can declare that this high-level uh, virtual panel closed right now. Thank you so very much, and you really cherish the golden rule as really like gold. And thanks a lot. Have a good night. Bye bye.